investors in Indonesia. We've spent lots of time with companies from Germany. I think one notable company is Metro. They're making large sums of investments in the retail sector and also property sector in Indonesia. <coughs> and I think they're gonna be introducing many more companies from Germany to make a foray into Indonesia. Germany stands at number 10 today. And I wanna share a bit of anecdote with you. In 2009, the US was nowhere in the picture. It was not even in the top 10. In 2010, the US was the third largest investor. In 2011, in the first semester, the US is already the second largest investor. Notwithstanding the precarious nature of their economy. And mind you, we're starting from a low base. We're not China, we're not India. But we were able to talk to a lot of people in the US who didn't even know where Indonesia was. And there's still a lot of people in Oklahoma who didn't know where Indonesia was. And we sat down with a number of think tank organizations, university professors and all that in the US and they got to know and we made the comparison between Indonesia, China and India and some other countries. Many people in the US thought that Singapore's economy is larger than Indonesia's. But when I present them the facts, Singapore is a mere 210 billion US. Indonesia is 720 billion. By 2014, Indonesia will be 1.1 to 1.2 trillion US dollars. Singapore will still be sub 300 billion. And they only have about four and a half million people. And we have a little bit more. <laughs> Scale is important. I think it's important to educate the investment thesis of Indonesia to the right people in a proportional manner. It's not about over telling the story. It's not about overselling the story. It's presenting it in a proportional manner. There are positivities, there are also negativities. But the view taking ought to be with respect to whether or not Indonesia is gonna get better five years from today, whether or not Indonesia is gonna be less corrupt five years from today whether or not Indonesia is gonna have less bureaucratic dead weight five years from today. I think more and more people are catching on to the song that Indonesia has a very good chance of becoming better. Now that's on the investment side. The third, which is the last topic, is really about the future. I like talking about the future because I can dream of it. If we were to take a 10, 15, or 20 year view of Indonesia, it's pretty sexy. It's likely to only grow because structurally speaking, we are less insulated from externalities or external shocks like some other countries in Asia who rely so much on export orientation and such Insulation within Indonesia, I think, can preserve the resilience that's there within Indonesia. The fact that we rely on consumption for up to 60% of our economy, I think, is a good indicator of how Indonesia can insulate itself from externalities. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to increase the export orientation of Indonesia. It doesn't mean that we don't have to alter anything that we have done so far. Now I think going forward, we would like to embark on a properly defined investment roadmap. The properly defined investment roadmap basically has four phases. The first one being basically the quick wins, taking advantage of the low hanging fruits, those that wanna invest in natural resources. That's an easy sell. Even my grandma can sell coal. Second phase, I mean the second phase of the investment roadmap is really building the infrastructure. And the infrastructure relates to the soft and the hard. The soft basically relates to education, healthcare. Education I think is an important one. I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be 50,000 Indonesians studying Germany. I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be many more studying in Europe and the US. And these are places with some of the best academic domain in the world. We only have 14,000 PhDs aligned in Indonesia. 
China has 500,000 PhDs alive. India has 500,000 PhDs, and Indonesia only produces about 800 PhDs a year. If you take a 20-year view, Indonesia is only going to be able to augment its number by a mere 16,000. Add that to the 14,000, we'll end up with only 30,000. Still a much lower figure than what China has and India has. I think we've got to be thinking big. We've got to be able to produce between 100 to 150,000 PhDs. Is it possible? It is, mathematically. Because by constitution, we're allocating 20% of our budget for education today. And we are legislated by constitution to spend 20% of our budget. And at the rate that our economy is growing, our fiscal space is only gonna grow. As such, the ability to spend on education will continue. But it does require some tweaking on vision and view taking so that we address the real issues in terms of how many PhDs, how many masters, how many bachelors. We take a 15 year view, in 2025, we would have about 18 million bachelor's degrees. 18 million bachelor's degrees produced off the local universities in Indonesia. Imagine if we were to get just 1% of that number to be PhDs, we will have 180,000 PhDs. I think these 180,000 PhDs that Indonesia will be able to produce if we get our act together right, I think we'll be able to help. The future of Indonesia is not just about selling coal, bauxite, oil and gas, nor palm oil. The future of Indonesia is one where many young Indonesians dream about, hopefully that the future Steve Jobs will be born in Papua. Hopefully the future Bill Gates will be born in Kalimantan. And that's not entirely impossible, as long as we take the right view, both from a fiscal and non-fiscal standpoint. We have crafted and launched the master plan called the MP3EI. This is basically a master plan that relates to not only the broadening, but also the deepening of the economy. And it has three spirits. The first one of which is really to further boost investment all across Indonesia. The second spirit is to synchronize the national action plan with that of the real sector. Many times people in the government come up with plans, but that plan doesn't talk with the real sector. It's to ensure that there is a gelling process between the action plan that's drafted and crafted by the government with the spirit of the real sector. The third spirit of this MP3EI, or the master plan, is really to ensure that there is a clusterization of economic development. And these clusters basically revolve around six corridors in Indonesia. The corridor of Sumatra, the corridor of Java, the corridor of Kalimantan, the corridor of Sulawesi, the corridor of Bali and Nusa Tenggara, and the last one, that of Maluku and Papua. Standard Charter came out with a report called the Super Cycle. And this is not BKPM that came out with this report. It's not the government of Indonesia. They came out with a report saying that Indonesia's economy is poised to grow in 2030 to 9.3 trillion US dollars. It's staggering. That's three times the size of Germany's economy. Germany is at 3.5 trillion US dollars today. But in 2030, or 19 years from today, Standard Chartered says at the rate it's growing, at the rate that it's been able to basically maintain a trajectory, there is no reason.